Amen. Let's take our seats. I have the pleasure of introducing one of my favorite pastors in Calvary Chapel. Since the first time I heard him speak, I loved um, his teaching in this man. So he is the teaching pastor at Calvary Chapel Downey. Can you help me welcome Pastor Art Reyes? How's everyone doing? You guys enjoying the conference so far? It's such a blessing, right? Let's give it up one more time that the Lord is just doing such a work. I'm going to invite you to open your Bible with me to the book of 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. And as was mentioned before already this morning, this book is a book about leadership. This book is a book about generations. And I love the name that we've used, the theme of this conference in regards to calling it the next conference, really looking to invest in the next generation. Because this book speaks of different generations in the nation of Israel. Because here we see through the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, different types of leaderships through the nation of Israel. But I want you to know something very clearly, that it's not simply about being the next generation. It's about are you going to be the one that honors God? Because there are many generations through the book of First and Second Kings that chose not to honor the Lord. And through the life of here, Elisha, as we study his life, as we look at his life, we, we start to understand that these miracles are not to do with Elisha, but they're revelations of God's grace and of God's mercy. That's what a miracle is. It's a revelation of God's grace and of God's mercy. We titled the message this afternoon, Lessons in the Wilderness. Lessons in the wilderness. There are many of us that find ourselves oftentimes in the spiritual wilderness of our lives. In a spiritual dryness where we need the Lord to fill us with the Spirit. And here we see a very important lesson in the wilderness. Second Kings chapter 3 verse 1 says this. Now Jehoram the son of Ahab became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Now Meshach, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So the king Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And then he said, which way shall we go? And he answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, today, Lord, we are walking by the way of the wilderness. And we pray, Lord, that you would teach us from the lessons that you have for us here in the wilderness. Lord, in the wilderness season, maybe of our spiritual walk, maybe of the ministry, where we find ourselves oftentimes stuck or dry or at a dead end. Lord, would you revive, would you fill, Lord, that thirsty land, the dryness of our hearts right now with your word, by your spirit alone, in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. There's going to be three major lessons that we find here in chapter 3 of 2 Kings. Number one is the way of rebellion. Number two, the way of prayer. And then number three, the way of victory. And what happens here is that you see that Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became the king of Israel. This was the son of Ahab, that wicked king of the nation of Israel. But you see that he wasn't as wicked as his father. 
In fact, it said that he became the king of Israel in the 18th year of the king of Jehoshaphat in Judah, and he reigned 12 years. But he did do evil in the sight of the Lord. Notice verse 1. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. This was a time of spiritual decline in the leadership of the nation of Israel when there was compromise. And I want you to know something very quickly. If there's compromise in the leadership, there's going to be corruption in the ministry. If there's compromise in the leadership, there will always be corruption in the ministry. And although it said that he wasn't as evil as or as the same extent as his father, notice how he describes what he did in verse 2. It said, because he put away the sacred peril bow that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted. Nevertheless, he compromised, notice in what sense here, in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin, he did not depart from them. He led others to continue to compromise and to sin. He led other people astray to also sin. But when he became king, it said that the Moabites rebelled against the nation of Israel. They found an opportunity to rebel, to no longer pay that heavy taxation to the nation of Israel. And notice what happens there in verse 4 and 5. It says, Now Messer, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and wool of 100,000 rams. So whether it was lambs or rams, he had to pay. And notice what happens here. That he finds an opportunity here, the king of Moab, to rebel and say, I no longer am going to pay. I'm going to rebel against you. I don't have to pay what you said. I don't have to do what you have asked of me. So what does the king do, the, uh, Je Jehoram of the nation of Israel? He allies himself to fight against the Moabites. He sees that there's a, a problem. He sees that there's a rebellion. He sees that there's opposition. And what does he call? He calls on the rest of the nation of Israel. Notice what happens here because it speaks of the character of a leader that relies on man. <laughs> Notice what takes place here. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. The way of the rebellion. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered, gathered all of Israel together. And then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying... The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against the king of Moab? He asked the king, are you going to go with me? Would you team up with me? Let's ally together. Let's go and fight against the Moabites because they rebelled against me and they no longer are paying this taxation. And he responds, I will go up. I am as you are my people, as your people, my horses as your horses. And he said, which way shall we go? Now notice what happens here to this king. Because he finds himself in a difficulty and he does the very thing that we oftentimes do in ministry when we find ourselves in opposition. When we find ourselves in a problem, when we find ourselves in a hardship of ministry. And what does he do here? He called and he went to Jehoshaphat to join him. Will you join me in battle? And he agreed. He called on Jehoshaphat. He called on man before he called on God. How many times in the ministry have you found yourself that before you call on God, you find yourself calling on man? And you're telling everyone what your problem is. You're telling everyone what your need is. You're making all kinds of calls, but you haven't called on God yet. And here he calls on Jehoshaphat. He says, which way are we going to go? Well, let's go the way of the wilderness. What route are we going to take? So in verse 9, it says that they gather together, verse 9, and the king of Edom also joined them. It says, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah, and the king of Edom here joined, all three of them. Jehoram, Jehoshaphat, Edom, and they all marched on the roundabout seven days in the wilderness, and there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. Notice what happens. And there was no water. No water for their army. No water for themselves. No water for their animals. No water for those that were following them. 
Jehoram here calls on a man. He goes the way of the wilderness, and he finds himself after seven days dried up at a hard place and a dryness here in the wilderness. And so often what happens here when we find ourselves in a place where we have nothing to drink is that we go into discouragement. And he says in verse 10, and the king of Israel said, alas, he cried out, what am I gonna do for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab? What should I do now? Desperate, needing an answer, wanting a solution. He cries out, what shall we do? The Lord called these three kings only to deliver us to the hand of Moab. You see here, he had nothing to give to the people to satisfy their quenching thirst. And he's now fearful that God hasn't called him to fight in this battle. You see, it's very important that you know that you realize that you cannot lead people in unbelief. That you can't lead people in fear. And here he is in, un in unbelief, in fear, not knowing what to do. Dried up in the wilderness now. Battling in the wilderness season. As oftentimes maybe you find yourself in that wilderness. What shall we do? We're so thirsty. We see the ministry. We're trying so hard. It's been seven days. We called on everyone. We have every possible volunteer now helping. What are we going to do? We're desperate for water. And we're also desperate for victory. What happens there? You've encountered a problem. In this dry season. This difficult route. Spiritually, you know what you need to do maybe in ministry right now? Ask God. Would you write that down? Would you remember that? Ask God. Don't ask man. Ask God. Because the way of the wilderness, the way of rebellion, led them to the way of prayer. And that's a very important for us to realize here as we learn now what takes place in verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, now after seven days... Is there no prophet of the Lord here? Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? It's a very important question here because Jehoshaphat knows. And he says, where's the prophet? We have to learn to ask God, what shall we do? Is there no prophet here of the Lord here? Is there anyone here or is there anyone here among us that knows how to hear the voice of God? You see that word inquire is a very important word. It says to ask the Lord or to consult. And here Jehoshaphat said, is there any prophet here so that we can ask God through him, what shall we do? It's important that we ask ourselves the question, is there anyone here right now that knows how to discern the voice of God? Not that is gifted, not that's talented, not that's charismatic, but does he know how to hear the voice of God? Do you know how to hear the voice of God right now? Do you know how to discern the voice of God? Is there anyone here that can hear his voice? And notice a servant said this in verse 11. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. You see, that's the key there. Of a man, of even a woman that God uses. Because here one of the servants recognized Elisha. And he said, there is a man whose name is Elisha. He was the servant of Elijah. And not only is Elisha known as a successor, Elisha is also known as a servant. There are too many people today that want to be known as successors, but very little that want to be known as servants. Because that's exactly who God uses, a servant. And what did he say? This Elisha, he was pouring water on Elijah's hands. He's faithfully serving in the little things. And God then gave him greater responsibility of leadership. But we learn through Elisha, I want you to know this, are you willing to serve other people? This is a very important lesson when it comes to our spiritual development in ministry and serving the Lord and identifying your calling, that you understand that ministry isn't buildings. Ministry isn't campuses. Ministry isn't 
conferences. Ministry is people. And you have to be willing to serve them. When we think of Elijah and Elisha, we, we quickly think about and assume on passing on the mantle of leadership. But I want to tell you for that Elisha here, for those servants here, for that next generation, before you take the mantle of leadership, before you take the mantle of leadership, you better know how to take the towel of servanthood. Do you know how to take the towel of servanthood? Because you have no business taking that mantle of leadership if you haven't first taken the towel of servanthood, willing to serve others and pull water to be a servant to wash their hands. Notice what happens here after. It says, verse 12, as they recognize Elisha. And it says here, and Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. He's recognized as a man who carries the word of God. In fact, you know what he says there in verse 12? The Lord speaks through him. <laughs> when people think about you, what do they say? Do they say the Lord speaks through him? The Lord speaks through her? I think it's always sad when I hear about people when they go to a church or, or they tell me what church they go to or they talk about their, the, the congregation or why they love going to church. You know what? I love going to that church. That pastor, he is so funny. <laughs> Funny, that, that's why you go to church funny. That's not why you should go to church. You should go to church because you want to be fed the living word of God. Because you need the Bible. And here he says we recognize Elisha. Notice here, because he says, because he's, he's the one who knows how to discern the voice of God. You know what a prophet is? Is one that can speak for God. Because they hear from God. One that can speak for God because they can hear from God. They can discern the voice of God. Do you know why a lot of people today don't know how to discern the voice of God? They can't discern because they're too distracted. And they want to be an imitation of everyone else, copying what everyone else says. And instead of speaking now for God, they're speaking for man. We have to be willing to say, today we want to recognize the voice of God. We want to be able to hear the voice of God. I think what's sad today oftentimes in the ministry is that people care more about their production meetings when the prayer meetings are dead. And nobody's going to those. There was two different types of leaders in the Old Testament. You had the priests and then you had the prophets. And you know what the priests relied on? The priests relied on methods. The prophets relied on prayer. The priest can easily say, you know what, I want to do my own will. And the priest didn't need to know the heart of the people. He didn't need to know the heart of God. He just needed to know the, he didn't need to know the ceremonies. He needed to know the rituals of the ministry. I can just go through the motions. I know how to do this. I'm a priest. I, I look like one that is a leader at church. And as a priest, you stop growing in your calling. You stop growing in the word of God only. You have really no relationship because it just becomes an outward appearance before people. But you know what a prophet does? He knows the heart of God. He truly knows the heart of God. And he knows also this, the heart of the people. He knows the heart of the people. He can hear God's word speaking. And he continues to grow in the word of God. He grows in fellowship with the word of God. He understands, she understands that, that person that is hearing from the Lord, they're calling, but that they're also are growing in the calling. It's, it's the fruit of the spirit. I think today, too many times, we have people that are just going through the motions instead of saying, I can hear the voice of God. The priest goes through the motions, but the prophet knows to hear the voice of God. The priest can perform his service, but the prophet speaks as a messenger of God. And the reason why we look at Elisha and Elijah's life is because we have to make sure that what we're doing is not a work of man, it's a work of God. <laughs> What's easy today is that you can make anything look spiritual. You can set up an environment where it looks like God is doing something when it's all just man-made. 
And notice verse 13, what happens, because it says, Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? They go now to Edom to find Elisha. And Elisha looks at them and says, What do I have to do with you? Why don't you go to your pagan prophets? Why don't you go to those false prophets that entertain you, that are leading you astray? But you know what happened to the nation of Israel, to Jehoram? He was lost. He was afraid. And he needed guidance. He needed direction. Today, do you need guidance in the wilderness? Do you need direction in the wilderness? You find yourself thirsty and you need somewhere to go. Go to the word of God to hear the voice of God. And notice as it continues here, it says, Go to the prophets of your father, the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver into the hand of Moab. Here he finds himself battling, wrestling with unbelief. That's what discouragement oftentimes do. You start to wrestle, question, and doubt in the wilderness season with unbelief. And he continues this way. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. Circle that in your Bible there. Before whom I stand. I'm not standing before man. I'm not trying to please anyone. I'm not trying to perform from anyone. I'm standing before God. That's who my ministry is. I'm not looking to get the approval of anyone. I'm looking to please the Lord. I'm looking to please the Lord. You you shouldn't look to get the approval of people so that you can be used by God. Serve because you want to please the Lord. And he says here, Elisha, in verse 14, Surely if if I did not regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. He said, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't give you the time of day. (laughs) Here it was the godly man of Jehoshaphat, a man that honored God, that God was able to use so he can work a miracle through. And you find here what takes place, the blessing of inquiring of God. Do you know what the blessing of inquiring of God looks like? What does it look like when God is speaking to you and you're hearing the voice of God? Not you're hearing the voice of man. You're hearing the voice of God. You're not looking at what someone else is doing and trying to replicate that, to replicate a work of God. Or say, you know, just because the Lord is doing it in in that church, he wants to do it in this church. (laughs) Notice what happens. The blessing of inquiring of God is, number one, the hand of God. Because it says here now in verse 15 that the hand of the Lord was present. Notice what happens here. Verse 15, but now bring me a musician, Elisha said. Bring me some worship. You want me to pray? Well, bring me some worship. And what kind of worship was it? It was anointed. He was a musician that would come and play. And Elijah was seeking the Lord. He was inquiring. He was consulting now for the nation of Israel. And notice something happens here. That God is working through that worship because it says, the hand of the Lord came upon him. When did the hand of the Lord come upon him? When he was praying. The hand of the Lord came upon him when he was worshiping, and the worship was anointed. What does God do? God is working through worship that is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Today, you know what we need? We need to have worship that draws us into the presence of God, not just worship that gets us excited. (laughs) I think a lot of times we want to just be excited. Is it drawing you to the presence of God? Is it anointed or is it just good music? There's a difference between having music and having worship. When you have worship, you know what happens? The hand of the Lord is present. (laughs) And the hand of the Lord means the power of God is present. It's not about having just good musicians. It's about, is the Holy Spirit working and drawing us to his presence through the worship? I've told the worship ministry many times as I grew up leading worship myself. What good is it to have a a good ear if you're going to have a bad heart? And so many times in the ministry we think, well, you know, I have a good ear, I'm talented, but I have a bad heart, and we forfeit the anointing for the talent. So here he says that the worship was playing and the power of the Lord came upon Elijah when he played. And this musician played. The Spirit of God was working. How many of us here know today 
that God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. He does inhabit his praises. And the hand of the Lord means that the power of God, it's not our power, it's not our experience, it's are you inquiring of God today? Are you inquiring of God? And you're going to be saying, well, you know what, we're doing everything right, and we still find ourselves in the wilderness season. We're doing everything right creatively. <laughs> we're doing everything right up to par, or when it comes to our even production, you can be doing everything right, but also doing all the wrong things. <laughs> are you praying? Are you asking of God? It's very important that we see this because everyone can, anyone can think of a good idea. <laughs> Anyone can think of a good idea, but we don't need any more good ideas. We need to hear the voice of God. That's what we truly need to do. We need to hear the voice of God. It was the hand of the Lord, and notice verse 16, it was the word of the Lord. It was the word of the Lord. Let's read verse 16. It says here, and he said, thus says the Lord, the word of the Lord, I've heard from the Lord, make this valley full of ditches <laughs> what we're in the wilderness and God it says start digging just think about that maybe you're right now in a in a place where it's hard where it's hard soil and you find yourself there's nothing coming out of this we're getting nowhere and the people are tired they're thirsty they need to be refreshed now but you go and inquire of God you go and seek the Lord and the Lord said make this valley right now full of water canals Make this valley now uh, full of trenches, trenches. Start digging. I'm going to give you water, but you need to start digging right now. And it says, verse 17, for thus says the Lord, you shall no, not see wind. Notice that. You're not going to see any wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet this valley shall be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals and yourself and all of you can drink. Isn't it incredible how the Lord works miracles when we hear the voice of God? We get instructions. We get directions now. You're not going to see any rain. You're not going to see any wind. Yet this valley is going to be filled with water. Yet this valley is going to be filled with water. This is so important for us to look at. You won't see rain and you won't see wind. Uh, there is too many times that that's what we're looking for to say that God is working in the ministry. <laughs> we want to see hype. We want to see now commotion. If there's commotion, if there's movement in the ministry or theatrics. <laughs> well, look at that. There's so much theatrics in the ministry or in the message or a spectacle. <laughs> we want to see a spectacle to think that God is moving when we don't understand to discern the moving of the Holy Spirit. He said, don't expect rain, don't expect wind, but the Lord's going to provide the water. It's not in your method. It's not in your spectacle. It's not in your commotion. It's not in even how loud you can get. It's you understanding that the miracle's going to happen when you ask of the Lord and you're faithful to do what he's called you to do. The miracle's happen. Even when you can't feel it, even when you can't see it, God will provide. So start digging ditches, he tells them, and break through the dryness of that soil and that hard ground. What does it take to dig ditches today? You know what it takes? Faith. To believe that God is going to do a work. Today, have faith. But it also takes obedience. That you would say, we're going to continue to dig, and it's God's responsibility to fill the ditches with water. There are too many times we're looking for the water when God is saying, I want you to dig the ditches. <laughs> what, what should we do today? Anticipate the blessing and don't question the ways of God. How do we question the ways of God? God, why am I still in this season? We should be in the next season already. Oh, God, you should have used me in greater ways already. Look, we're in the wilderness season. We find nothing happening. But he says, I want you to continue to dig the ditches. I've promised it. Now you get ready for it. Dig the ditches. There's some people that want the blessing but don't want to prepare for it. 
They just want the blessing to come to them. You see, we have a responsibility to prepare for the blessing that he wants to bring by our faith and by our obedience. It was the hand of God. It was the word of God. And number three, it was the sight of God. It was in the sight of the Lord. Notice verse 18. And this is a simple matter. This is not a big deal for God. It may be a big matter for you, but it is a simple matter. In whose sight? In the sight of the Lord. Not in your sight, but it's in the sight of the Lord. So don't be afraid. You see, we get very oftentimes frustrated because we are looking at things through our perspective instead of through his power. Look at it through his power, through the sight of the Lord. Not through our perspective, not where you find yourself, but what has God called you to do? And notice as he continues, and he says here now, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. He's going to deliver them to your hand. Not only is he going to supply the water, he's also going to provide the victory. And I want you to attack. And I want you to have victory over them. He says, also, you shall attack every fortified city. Every city that finds themselves protected, attack them. Expect the victory. And every choice city shall be cut down, every good tree. And it shall stop up every spring of water. Every shall become a ruin, every good piece of land with stones. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered. Don't you love this? He told them to start digging ditches. And in the sight of the Lord, notice what he says, he is going to provide. He is going to provide. Even in the hard times, what does God say? Continue to dig ditches. Continue even when it becomes really hard. You know why? Because ministry is not for the faint of heart. It's for those who have their heart set on the Lord in faith. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, act not in the mere strength of what you have, but in the expectation of that of which you've asked. How many times do we say, well, you know what? We're doing ministry, but we can't do things because we don't have resources. Or we don't have a certain, now, uh, uh, now even place or, or a building. The missionary William Carey said it best. He said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Are you expecting great things from God today? As you're digging ditches there, as you're breaking the hard ground and hard soil of that wilderness season in which you are in right now? Because digging ditches, it's a lot like the leadership that you find yourself in. It is hard work. Ministry, it's not a fantasy. It's a, it's a reality. And oftentimes in ministry, you're going to find yourself digging ditches when, when, when you have no faith in what's taking place now, but what's going to take place later. And you get criticism by people by saying, what is that person still doing? Are they still digging ditches out there? It can seem something that's so unimpressive. It's not spectacular. You're out in the wilderness. Nobody even knows you're still there. But God's provision invites our hard work. It never excuses our laziness. We cannot just say, well, the Lord's going to do something big, and we're just going to sit down and wait for it to happen. And notice, we're going to be entitled to that blessing. God wants your faithfulness. God wants your diligence, and the measure of water and refreshment and blessing that is available to these thirsty people here is directly connected to how faithful they were to dig those ditches. The bigger the ditches were, notice what happens here, the more water that was going to be provided. And yes, it was going to be hard work. It's going to be unpleasant work. But the more they did, the more blessing they were going to receive. So what is it? It's the word of the Lord. It's the hand of the Lord. It's the sight of the Lord. But it's also, in verse 20, the work of the Lord. It tells in the next day, in verse 20, in the morning when the grain offering was offered, that suddenly water came by Edom, and the land was filled with water. The next morning, 
At the time of sacrifice, at God's appointed time, God's work was done in God's timing. You know what I like? And we understand that it's God's timing because it, said it happened suddenly. <laughs> you oftentimes are expecting it and wanting it and Lord, bring it already. He wants you to fill these ditches with water. But then notice how it happens. It oftentimes happens suddenly. By the provision of God as you're working there and being faithful now. They are now receiving the water or the blessing of their obedience. They are being refilled. They are being refreshed. They are being restored in their obedience. Where do those things happen? It happens when you continue to be faithful. When you're diligent, when you're consistent, when you're faithful digging ditches. What happens? Suddenly, God will bless. There are too many times right now where we are digging ditches and we're in the ministry. And you know what you start to do? You start getting tired of digging. And you start to look at somebody else's ditch and you say, well, you know what? My, how come their ditch is bigger than my ditch? How come they're in a, you know, they're, they're digging deeper than I am right now. They're, they're farther in than I am right now. We become very discouraged because we start to look at what someone else is doing instead of what God called us to do. Because we start to compare that and then notice what happens. We become discouraged. I, I recently heard that the only thing worse than a discouraged leader that drops out and leaves the ministry is one who drops out but stays in the ministry. How many leaders are there today that have dropped out, that stopped digging, but they're still in the ministry? They've checked out. They have no vision. They're going through the motions. Because I want you to know that, that your heart is revealed not when things are going good. Your true heart for the ministry is revealed when things are hard. When it's not easy. And today it, it is sad that we see people that they value excitement more than endurance when the excitement wears out are you still going to be faithful or do you always need to be excited do you always need to be in a novelty something has to be new here he teaches us elijah is hearing from the lord and he's given us a very important lesson that ministry is not a performance you have to work at being obedient and being faithful what God has called you. It's not a place to showcase your gifts. To showcase now who you are or your talents. People, you know what I've learned even today, especially in the social media world that we live in right now, that everyone wants to just promote themselves. Understand this, especially if you're one that teaches God's word. Nobody cares about your little power lines and the message. About your stories. You know what they need? They need the words of eternal life. Where you're feeding the people. Is the congregation, are the people that you're serving, are they being fed? Because there's too many pretenders now, even in the pulpits. You know why you have a shallow ministry sometimes? Why you have a shallow teaching at times? Because you're not digging deep to be filled with the living water. You're not digging deep, so it's become very shallow in the ministry. And there's nothing fresh to say now. <laughs> you get a leader, a pastor, a servant of the Lord that is not digging deep. Notice you're not going to have anything fresh to say. And notice what you do. You start using recycled messages. Because you haven't heard from God. You have nothing to say. And then you become more concerned about how your ministry looks instead of if it's real and if it's living. Uh, no, notice this, you can have a ministry today that looks cool but's dead. <laughs> and then you know what it is? It's good for nothing. So we have to be those like Elijah that are inquiring of God and saying we're willing to dig ditches. We're willing to be in the trenches. I don't want to just stand on the platform. I want to be in the trenches with the people digging. I want to be willing to get my hands dirty. Not to say, Lord, I want, it, I want the blessing, I want you to use me, but my ego's too big to dig a ditch. Or I always want people to see what I'm doing. This is really what success looks like in ministry. It looks like obedience. You know what it also looks like? It looks like patience. Patience is a sign of maturity. 
And today, if you stop digging ditches, if you stop breaking through that ground, I want to ask you, have you stopped because you have unbelief, because you lack faith, or because you lack vision? Continue to dig the ditch that God has given you. Because nobody is going to dig for you. There are too many times that we're unwilling to take a step of faith and we're, we're doubting God. But here we see what happens here because it says suddenly water came because they were faithful now. And you know what water is in the Bible? It's a sign of two things. When you look at scripture, it's a sign of the word of God. You see in Ephesians chapter 5, washing by the water of the what? Of the word. Jesus said in John chapter 7, if anyone's thirsty, come to me, and out of you will flow out torrents of living water, a sign of the Holy Spirit. So a sign of the word and a sign of the Holy Spirit. This is what gives us the victory against the Moabites in the ministry and in our lives. We need both of these things, the word and the Holy Spirit. Not just the Holy Spirit and not just the word. We need both of them. I've heard it before, when you have all word and no spirit, what happens? You dry up. You have no word and all spirit, you blow up. But you have the word and the spirit, what happens? You grow up. And that's exactly what we need to do to grow up in the word and in the spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be anointed like Elisha. You know what he was? He was anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. Before the anointing, I used to talk to people. But now with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God talks to people through me. And I'm able to say what he has for them. Notice what happens the way of victory in verse 21. It says, and when all the Moabites heard that the king had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms. And the older who were gathered, they stood at the border. What happens? They're standing there at the border now waiting to fight after they have been filled with the water. <laughs> After they have been faithful to dig, the victory is always one step away from faith. The victory is always one step away from obedience. And it says, and they rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on the water of those ditches, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. <laughs> and they look at the water, they find, they think that is blood right there. They misunderstand what it is. And it says, verse 23, and he said, this is the blood of the kings. Surely they struck swords and have killed one another now. Therefore Moab to the spoil. So when they had come to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities. Each man threw a stone on every good place of the land and filled it and they stopped up all the springs of water and cut down all the good trees, but they left the stones of Kir Hashath intact according to the slingers surrounded and attacked it. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took for him 700 men who drew the sword to break through to the king of Edom, but he could not. The enemy could not withstand the people that had been refreshed with the water. Notice what's happening. They have the victory here. It says, then he took the eldest son who would have reigned in the place and offered him as a burnt offering. And he was a great indignation against Israel. So they departed from him and returned to their own land. What does it teach you here? That the victory comes after you've been faithful, digging deep in the word of God and being filled in the Holy Spirit. You want the victory today? Dig deep in the word of God and be filled by the torrents of the Holy Spirit. Today, maybe you find yourself in the wilderness season and a dry season. Remember what Paul told the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, I love you, brethren. Be steadfast. Don't be moved. Be unmovable. Always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. When it's in the Lord, it's not in vain. But when it's in your energy, when it's in your strength, when it's in what you can do to try to entertain people, then that is all vain. 
But when it's in the Lord, it's going to have a fruitful result of digging down deep in the Word of God and being filled by the Holy Spirit. Number one, notice this, your one step of faith, your one step of obedience away from the victory that God has for you. Remain faithful. Continue to dig. Be steadfast and movable. Number two, hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God. Don't hear the voice of man. Hear the voice of God. Do not be swayed with distractions. Don't be swayed with distractions. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, be diligent. You know what diligent means? Be faithful. Be diligent. Present yourself. Approve to God. Present yourself someone that is approved to God, a worker who does not need to shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know that Paul was a tent maker and he spoke to Timothy? Paul had to cut the skins of those tents. And when he says rightly dividing the word of truth, that's what he speaks about, that you would cut now that word of God, cut it straight as someone that was cutting that skin for that tent, straight, rightly divided, cut it straight, the word of truth. Hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God. Be fully prepared and equipped with the word. And then finally, number three, as much as God has called you to dig the ditch, Rely not on your strength to dig that ditch. Rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Not on your power, but on his power. Do you remember when the Lord called Zerubbabel to build and rebuild that temple in the Old Testament? And he said, how can I possibly rebuild this? And the Lord said, not by now through Zechariah, also the prophet, hearing from the Lord, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How are we to, today to do ministry? By hearing the voice of God and saying, it's not by my power. It's not by my might. It's not by my experience. It's not by my charisma. It's not about my strength or striving or being anxious. It's simply by the spirit of the Lord doing the work of the Lord. My responsibility is to dig the ditch. God is the one that's going to fill it with water. And you know what happens? After that, you're able to see the victory. Maybe today you're here and you find yourself in a place where you keep hitting hard soil and hard ground. And today God is saying, I want you to know that I want to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to dig deep into my word, but I want you to rely on my spirit, that that water, that refreshment that we need that comes from the Spirit. As Jesus said there in John chapter seven, if anyone's thirsty, as those people there in the wilderness were thirsty, if anyone's thirsty, what does he say? Come to me, come to me. Promising them the Holy Spirit. And out of your most innermost being shall flow torrents of living water even in the wilderness. Is anyone thirsty here today that they want to be filled with living water? I'm going to ask you to stand right now if you're thirsty. And that you would just come to the front because we're going to pray right now. That we would be filled with torrents of living water. Just stand right there on your feet and come on forward. as We're going to have the pastors up here. But you're saying, you know, today I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm in a dry season. I'm in a dry land. I'm in the wilderness season. And the Lord is calling you right now not to depend, not to rely, not to pretend that everything is okay. No, you need to be filled. You need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Just move on forward. There's more that are coming right now. If you're thirsty right now, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand up right where you are. Don't leave without being filled. Today we want to say we want to continue to dig those ditches. We want to continue to be faithful where God has called us. We don't want to be moved. We want to be swayed. Let's sing this song. Let's worship the Lord. And right now as we worship the Lord, we're raising our hands saying, Lord, we want to be filled by you right now, Lord. We need you, Jesus. I'm going to invite you right now to that person that's to the left and to the right of you. Just put your hand 
on their shoulder and begin to pray for them. That God would fill them, that God would strengthen them. Lift your voice right now audibly that we can hear the voices praying and fill this room. Let me pray for the discouraged, for those that are filled with doubt, for those that are filled with dis disobedience, maybe, maybe in life, Lord, not doing that which you called us to do, God. When we find ourselves thirsty in the wilderness, God, that you would fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, right now. Fill us with your presence, Lord Jesus. We don't want to go through the motions. We want to hear the word of God, Lord. We want to serve in the sight of God, Lord, by the power of God, Lord, that you would do the work of God right now, Lord, in your church, in this generation, Lord. We're thirsty for what you want to do, God. And we ask for the torrents of living water that they would just flow from our innermost being, God, that we would be refreshed and see the victory that you would have.
And we're so grateful, Lord. Your spirit works, Lord. Lord, we ask that maybe today you need to break that hard wilderness soil that exists in our own hearts. That you would give us a breakthrough so your spirit can fill us, Lord. And that out of our innermost being, there would flow torrents of living waters. So we ask for the refreshment of your spirit, the refilling of your spirit right now, Jesus. That we would not seek to be satisfied or quenched of our thirst in the world. Or quenched of our thirst in distractions or entertainment, Lord. But Lord, that we would seek, Lord, to dig deep in your word, Lord. And that as a result, Lord, your spirit would fill us. It would be the word of God working through the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we need today, Jesus, more than ever. So I pray for those that are struggling, those that are anxious, those that are discouraged. That you would give us an extra measure of your spirit, a double portion of your spirit to continue. In Jesus' name we pray this. Together we said, amen. Amen. God bless you.